She looks good. I like the half cocked hat, you know? Mm -hmm. You're looking good, Miss Lil. Lily Cam is on. Lily Cam is on. Anytime. All right. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Well, I, asked, I went over all this stuff about the NIH and the cost of facilities, administrative stuff, and everyone seemed to understand it except one of my good friends, a scientist and researcher, said, I get it all, but I don't understand why is the administrative and facilities cost so variable between, you know, institutions? Why can it go from like 30 to 70 percent? And that's a good question. And the reason is, uh, the cost of a building in San Francisco or New York City is different from the cost of a building in Biloxi, Mississippi. And the same thing for salaries. So the problem is that in these geographic regions that are highly expensive and have buildings that cost more, their expense is more. Now you could say, well, just cap it. Yeah, well, that would just say then the best place to do research is where nobody is, where the costs are very low. And the trouble with that is, of course, you know, these, these institutions, the, particularly the research-intensive institutions that spin off startup companies that end up feeding drug development and device development are generally around academic centers in places where the cost of living is a little higher and buildings cost more. So it's one of those things that in order to sort of distribute uh, the resources to the best places, you have to have geographic diversity. If you have geographic diversity, you have to have variable costs. So hopefully that explains it. I, I did that over the phone with a friend and he understood it then. So anyway. My sister said we have to have a Q&A. It's been a while, so we're going to ask, they're going to have a Q&A. And I got a ton of questions, obviously, about measles. So we're going to talk about measles. And once again, it's not like you can't escape this. OK, so my favorite question is measles contagious, very contagious. Well. We've been talking about this forever. I mean, we've been talking about this since COVID. So uh, think about um, seasonal flu. A person walks into a room and generally will infect two people, two and a half. I guess you can't infect a half a person. Two to three people. And, and COVID started off like that. You know, it was a little bit more infectious to have that R number of five or six. So a person walks in a room and infects five or six people. Well, with measles, a person walks in a room and infects 10 to 18, more like 18. So yes, it is actually one of the most infectious diseases uh, we know. And as a result, if, there, if, there's, if there, it's introduced into a community where people are not vaccinated, and as I've said before, you need over 95% of the population vaccinated to prevent an outbreak. If someone introduces measles into, the, into an unvaccinated group, you can have an outbreak. And we have a bunch, we have up to 124 cases already, including the first death, we assume, of a school-aged child. So. Um, I will go through the Texas data in a little bit, but it's really amazing. So is it, is it dangerous? Doesn't seem like it's that bad a disease. People ask, well, how is it dangerous? Well, uh, usually people, the kids present early on with the fever and what's called coryza. They have runny nose and uh, conjunctivitis. Uh, and they start with a rash on the face that usually goes downward. But it's, it, when it's severe, it can cause a pneumonitis, a pneumonia, and also an encephalitis. Uh, and there can be consequences of the encephalitis. As I've said a couple of times when I was growing up, everybody had measles. So you have thousands and thousands of kids, but in that larger number that have uh, infection, I saw all the complications. I saw kids with encephalitis. I saw kids with pneumonia. Uh, I had a friend that was basically deaf because of the, as a consequence of the encephalitis. So it was a terrible disease that we basically eliminated until we didn't, anyway. So how long, is another question, how long does the measles virus stay in the air? Well, it's actually one of those uh, viruses that can actually be suspended in, in the air for quite a long time, uh, up to probably two hours. And the other thing is, it's, it's not only spread as an aerosol floating in the air, but it also spread by uh, fomites or touching uh, surfaces. So it can stay alive on a, vir on a surface for a long period of time. So if, you know, you have a person who coughs and has measles, walks in the room, coughs and leaves, and you put 20 people into that room, there's a 90% chance that, you know, they're going to get infected. So 18 out of 20 would get infected. How long can an infected person spread the virus? Well, uh, they're quite infectious before, uh, before the rash, up to about four days before the measles rash, and about four days after the, uh, the rash. So it takes a long time to clear this virus, and so kids remain infectious for a long period of time. 
Uh, somebody asked, can I get measles by touching a contaminated surface? Lily, don't touch any contaminated surfaces down there. You can't control them. Anyway, yes, I was just mentioning uh, it can be on surfaces, last for a long period of time, and if someone touches it and it touches their face, they're likely to get it. Uh, measles cases are rising in the U.S. Do adults need a vaccine or a booster? And uh, this is really an important. Uh, let me go over the current CDC recommendations for vaccination. So for children, it's, uh, uh, the recommendation is two doses of measles, mumps, and rubella, MMR. The first dose happens within 12 to 15 months uh, after birth. And then the second dose is right when kids begin to go to, to school, like 46 years. Two doses of the vaccine are 97% effective at preventing measles. Uh, and I'll show you the data for that in a little bit. One dose is 93%, but the range is quite large. So it ranges from 40% to 100% effective. So that's the problem and you, that, has, that it has an impact on the cases in, in Texas. If you only have one, uh, it's not necessarily as, it's definitely not as good as getting two. And again, I'll show you the data for that. Now, adults, first of all, if you've had uh, evidence of presumptive evidence of immunity, you're okay. So what is presumptive evidence? Written documentation that you've had an adequate vaccine, so your doctor tells you you've been adequately vaccinated. Laboratory evidence of immunity, so you have antibodies to it. Laboratory confirmation of the disease, in other words, you had measles and you got over it. And then my favorite, birth before 1957, <laughs> that unfortunately applies to me. And that's because everybody before 1957, uh, when the vaccine was initiated, uh, everybody had measles. So we we're all assumed to have been uh, infected by it. Uh, if, if you don't have that as an adult, then one dose uh, should be effective. And then there's also uh, a gr other groups that are probably need to get a dose if they don't know. So college students, if they're not sure or don't have evidence, should definitely get vaccinated. If you're traveling internationally, that's how, vac that's how measles gets introduced in this country very often and someone travels to another country where measles is present and brings it into this country. Healthcare personnel, if they don't have ev evidence for immunity, they should definitely be vaccinated. Uh, people who've been, who are in close contacts with immunocompromised people. So you have a person with cancer in your family who's under chemotherapy. It's important that you're vaccinated. People with HIV infection, uh, adults who got the inactivated form of the measles vaccine which happened in a very small window, 1963 to 1966. So again, that's something you should discuss with your physician uh, and then anybody who's at great risk during, a vac during an outbreak. Have there been measles epidemics in the U.S. before? Well, good question. <laughs> there have been many. Uh, before the vaccine was introduced, there were a lot in the 50s, but we said we've had uh, small outbreaks in the 80s, between 89, 91, 88 to 90, and 2019. Uh, in, before the vaccine was introduced, there were estimated three to four million cases per year, usually 48,000 hospital, hospitalizations and as many as 450 deaths. In 2019, there was a national, there was a nationwide outbreak with 1,200 cases that I remember it very well. It started in an Orthodox Jewish community in New York and New Jersey uh, in a group of people who were, didn't get vaccinated. Uh, so the United States is thought to be eliminated in the U.S. since 2000, but we keep having these outbreaks. So let me show you the data for this. This is actually really fascinating. I've shown it before. Once the vaccine was introduced, we, the case number dropped dramatically. And this was when you had one, one vaccine only. But there was little outbreaks in 70, in between uh, about 78, 79, and an outbreak in 1990. Uh, and because of these little blips where you have these outbreaks, what was happening is people who had only one vaccination were still susceptible in some cases, and so they'd have these tiny outbreaks. So that was when uh, the second dose was recommended in 1989. And from the year 2000, we all celebrated because basically it was eliminated from the United States. And this is where human behavior, I just don't understand. I'm getting vaccinated. I don't see measles, so what's the point in getting vaccinated? It's, there's no measles around. It's, people forget it's because they're vaccinated. So they stop getting vaccinated. What happens is then, you know, there's a susceptible population in other parts of the world. If someone comes in who's been exposed, then you start having outbreaks. And you can see in 2023, we start having little cases. In 2024, fair number of cases. And we were having more cases now in 2025. So if you look back in 2024, there were 285 cases, mostly in uh, under five years of age and between five and 19. And again, most of them were unvaccinated, 90%. Uh, 
7% uh, had one MMR dose and only 4% had two. Uh, it's not 100% effective, but it's very effective, 97% effective. Uh, but 40% of the hospitalized cases, 40% uh, of the cases were hospitalized, hospitalized. So when you get it, it's a pretty, it's a serious disease, and people get the pneumonia, it can be quite, uh, quite serious. Now this year we're on track to beat that 285 cases. In fact, in the state of Texas, we have 124 already. So it's mostly been an outbreak that's taken place in uh, western, in northwestern Texas, in these counties. We're up to 124 cases. The major county that's involved is 80. Uh, it started probably in a Mennonite community that was under-vaccinated. Uh, most of the cases are between 0 and 17 years of age. I'm almost 100 of the 124. Okay, so it's gotten to be pretty serious, and as I mentioned, we've had one child that's, uh, we don't know the exact age yet, has been reported, but one death so far. And that's what's the sad part about that. The hospitalizations and the death can all be uh, prevented by getting vaccinated. So hopefully people will take it more seriously in the future. All right, questions about the seasonal flu. I heard it's widespread in California. What's going on with them? It's California. <laughs> Can't explain it, except it's California. Uh, so over 900 people have died from flu so far since October in California. 15 children. A quarter of these deaths were under the were people under the age of 65, and 700 deaths over the age of 65. So it has been a very very bad flu season. And again, it's I, I don't know what the vaccination status is, but it's very likely to be in people who were under vaccinated. But we'll we'll see. The data for that aren't clear. Here's, uh, here's a good one. I, I like that. This is I love these questions. Keep sending them in. I'm a Baylor graduate, long time retired, watch a show each week. God bless you for that. Uh, so does my sister. Uh, I have many hummingbird feeders up, as do I, by the way. Uh, as do people in Phoenix as well in Texas. How significant are the chances of getting bird flu into the house uh, or into the laundry room when I go refill my feeders, I bring them in the house? I've not been able to find any information. Do hummingbirds carry the bird flu? Uh, do, what about birds other than hummingbirds that often frequent my feeders? Well, I have to tell you, I've got bluebird boxes all over. I've got a video camera on one of my feeders. I've got hummingbird feeders everywhere. So I love, I love American songbirds, so I'm a big fan, so I understand. And there's no evidence right now that those, those are the birds that are uh, infected with, with uh, avian flu. Now, it, it's been unheard of so far. Fowl are the most uh, at risk. So domestic poultry, chickens, and turkey probably spread through uh, because of the close quarters. And they have been infected li largely from uh, wild waterfowl such as swans, ducks, and geese. Uh, so, you know, uh, there are wild birds that are, uh, that are kept by people who are susceptible, and that includes the Australian bush turkey, whatever that is, uh, scarlet macaws, the common quail, parrots, blue cranes, peacocks, flamingos, ostriches and common pheasants. And uh, so, you know, while uh, it, it is unlikely uh, that the, the birds that you're seeing are be infected, uh, but again, it's, you know, it's common sense, minimize your, your exposure to fecal material. You know, I wouldn't stop feeding it, but I probably wear a mask when I change it, I put on gloves. Uh, that just makes sense. If you're, if you're handling contaminated uh, boxes or feeders with, uh, you know, bird stuff on them, I'd wear it. I personally, what I do is change with a mask and, and gloves, and then I throw those away. All right, another great question is, when is flu season over? <laughs> it's, it's over when it's over. Uh, usually March. Uh, that's when it usually ends, but it, it ends when, you know, we start having, stop having cases. So far, we've had uh, 12,000 uh, new influenza cases in the state of Texas just at last week. Okay, does a face mask offer protection from all viruses? Uh, well, the N95 back, uh, masks actually are very good at, at, at protecting against all viruses. Remember, we talked about it back in the COVID days. It's not the size of the pore that's so matter. It's usually the electrostatic charge that makes the viruses come and bind to the mask. But N95s are very good. We use them. That's why we use them in, in the, you know, surgical suites and um, in hospitals. Can I get the flu if I got a flu shot? Yes, you can. In fact, it's not that uncommon. Uh, the shot is about 40 to 60 percent effective at preventing it, but the most important thing is prevents it from uh, from serious disease. So when you get an, an intramuscular injection, 
you generate a response, which is an IgG response, which is circulating antibodies in the blood. So when you get infected, you already have, if you have exposure to the virus, you already have antibodies in your blood, so it prevents the virus from getting into your blood and circulating and getting really bad. But it doesn't prevent it from getting into your mucosal surfaces. And so you're likely, if you do get the flu after vaccin uh, vaccination, you're likely to have a short, you know, maybe a one-day fever, cough, maybe a headache, or runny nose. But, but you already have antibodies, so you should be able to handle it pretty well. I always like to end because our Texas Epidemic Public Health Institute, it's so cool that we can actually follow all the viruses in our wastewater. So based on what's going on the last week, we're seeing huge peaks in influenza, um, A and B, or A mostly, but A and B, and also in respiratory syncytial virus, A and B. SARS-CoV-2 is beginning to increase a little. So most of the time, if a person shows up with a fever and cough or whatever, they're likely to be flu, maybe RSV. It's less likely to be uh, SARS-CoV-2, and you can always touch yourself for SARS and for flu to find out. Anyway, thank you for your questions. It's always a joy to get them and answer them, uh, and I appreciate that. So we're going to end today with a few shout-outs. Miss Lily, okay. Today is a National Thank a Resident Day. This is when medical schools and hospitals collectively show our appreciation for our resident physician and fellows, those trainees that have graduated from medical school but are learning, it's called graduate medical education, learning to be specialists in their field. Uh, and they are a big part of the healthcare team, so we, we love them and we cherish them and we thank you for being a resident in our program. Also, today, although I'm not dressed appropriately, today is Go Texan Day. Lily is dressed appropriately. It marks the beginning of the Houston Livestock uh, Show and Rodeo. Baylor is once again supporting the chuck wagon races, and we will be giving away tickets to the rodeo and concert performance to members of the Baylor community. Uh, there's a link on the In Touch website so you can find out where to get those. And of course, this weekend marks the beginning of the holy month of Ramadan. My best wishes to all the members of the Baylor community who are serving this time of fasting, prayer, and reflection. Have a wonderful weekend. Have a great Go Texans Day, and I can't wait to see you next week.